I'm Greg Wheatley, and my guest today on Inside Wheaton is Dr. Jeffrey Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg is professor of geology at Wheaton College, been here nearly 30 years, and I'm looking forward to getting to know him a little bit and some of the things he does here. Jeff, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. Nearly 30 years at Wheaton College, right? Well, going on 29, actually, so 30 sounds more severe. <laughs> we'll, keep, we'll keep it at 29. <laughs> uh, agreed. Uh, we'll go with that. It's amazing. That's, yeah. a, that's a good, solid tenure here. Yeah, it really is. How has Wheaton changed in those years? Boy, that's a tough question. And, you know, I, you, buildings, obviously, some of the physical plant and some of the people, the uh, obviously faculty and administrators and others have come and gone. And the students, well, you know, trying to figure out how the students have changed. Some people think that in some ways the students end up with more personal kind of emotional issues and family issues than they used to in the old days. Um, hard to say. It's hard to say. So I don't know. It's, it's uh, you know, the old idea of the, or the adage, the fable of putting a frog in a, in a pan of hot water. So it doesn't jump out and you gradually turn right. up the heat until you cook it. I, I think to some extent the changes have been so gradual that it's very difficult to document those. But uh, we have a new science building now, which is just magnificent yes, you do. It's for us. Place. Oh, it's been, it's been a, a wonderful addition. Yeah. And uh, so things like that that are you know, really very thankful for. But a lot of things, fortunately, are fairly continuous and, and represent uh, stability, I think, too. So Wheaton is still a stable place, even though it's going through some tough Students uh, still, cultural I, times. Um, most professors that I ask when they come in here, what do you like best? It's almost always... Oh, I love the students. That's right. They're, they're inquisitive, aren't they? They're a, they're a good bunch of kids. Well, you know, I mean, they're they're Christians, but they're people. They come from all kinds of different backgrounds, and a lot of them have a strong sense of wanting to change the world. Mm -hmm. That's true of non-Christian students too. But these yeah. guys have the foundation. They have the potential to grasp the foundation that really makes a big difference. Yeah. Let me ask you, Jeff, about, uh, I know you were on sabbatical, I don't know if it was full year or half year, half year. last year. Yeah. Um, what did you end up doing? Well, I, sitting there trying to think of all the things I, I would like to do and things I should do. So I did a little bit of traveling, really, but it was fairly effective. Um, first thing I, I think that uh, I kind of had to do was... Um, uh, get back to um, work we were doing in Eastern Europe in Kosovo. And that was my fourth visit. And actually, I'll be on my fifth visit here just in a few days. Mm -hmm. But working with a group called Water for Life, which is a spinoff of YWAM, that uh, helps the local people in their villages get decent water and sanitation, things that they're sorely lacking, and to make relationships. And I try to tell people this is really doing... Um, it's doing that heart evangelism thing to show people that you really care. And they're very open to Americans, and they're open to issues of faith, hmm. much more so than some other parts of Europe that have been secularized. Right. So it's a 90% Muslim, some of it nominally Muslim population. But it's an opening part of the world right now where there is a door open for influence, and we just want to go and make some positive influence, bringing students in particular to help exercise some of their own abilities that they've gained in classrooms and in experiences, but now to actually use those in sort of an academic scholarly outreach mm -hmm. uh, instead of making a separation between what we do as so-called missions and what we do as academics, but bring the two of those together. And it's interesting, uh, you as a geologist and the earth sciences and water, um, mm -hmm. right. and water, it's huge, isn't it? We, we turn on that tap and we take it for granted, yeah. but um, in a large part of the world, that's it's a it's a really precious commodity. Isn't yeah, it? and it's getting more so in our own country too, particularly because of uh, waste, a tremendous amount of waste, and, and entitlement for some people who figure they can use all the water. Where the a lot of times the local people, those who have less financial advantage, are are left short. Mm -hmm. And it's a constant legal battle in this country and an ethical battle in other places as well. But water, yeah, what a what a symbol, what a what a spiritual and physical symbol water is. Water yeah. of life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you've taught a wide variety of courses in your twenty nine, not thirty, years here. Uh, what do you like best? What do you like to teach? Well, I just got back from the Wheaton College Science Station out in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and uh, 
that has been an incredible godsend for me as a geologist. Um, people have to recognize that if you are a, an outdoor scientist, uh, Wheaton is a rough area. Mm. This is people talk about how they enjoy living in Chicago because of all the culture and the music and the art museums and uh, that's nice stuff. But for a <laughs> geologist, but for a geologist, getting out amongst the things that right. God has created, you know, firsthand, is very very important. And I've been able to, with my family, uh, almost every summer at Wheaton, get to the Black Hills, and it's a better place for students because they're taking one class at a time. They're out amongst, us, again, God's stuff. They're learning about it firsthand. And they're making relationships. It's a very family kind of an oriented environment. And so for me, clearly, even though it's a difficult job teaching that sort of uh, education to undergraduates, uh, I find it to be the most rewarding and the one that sort of more fills up my soul than sitting mm. in a classroom all the time. <laughs> but there's several other classes that each one has its own little uh, goodies and little baddies, you know. Uh, are yeah. we still um, finding out brand new things about the Earth? All the time. I mean, is it, uh, what, what are some of the exciting finds that scientists are making? Well, that's an interesting question because if you read some of the popular media stuff that comes out, they'll take something that scientists have done in the past or more recently and inflate these things into these big spectacular stories that very often are you know, not that sensationalized. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're interesting things. I mean, they've they've discovered a fair abundance, they think, of a mineral that contains uh, the components of the water molecule, OH and hydrogen together, deep in the earth, over five, six, seven hundred kilometers down in the earth. And and one of the, uh, the popularized um, headlines came out and said, more water than all of the oceans is contained beneath it. Well, yes and no, you know, it's not. <laughs> but it is fascinating to realize that even at great depths that you have volatile components in some of the minerals that are down there under very, very high pressure. <laughs> so things like that and uh, those sort of real scientific things pop up every once in a while. But most of what we do in earth science is really devoted to the more pragmatic things, especially uh, the increase of wealth because of so much exploitation now in, in fossil fuels and in uh, mineral deposits and things like that. So the world is in a boom, a, still a growth boom. Yeah. And most of the people in our business are involved in that somehow. Hmm. Whenever you talk about um, geology or or any of the earth sciences, of course, you're you're beginning to think about how did all this come to be mm -hmm. in the first place? Um, I suppose biology more has to do with us. How did we get here? Yeah. But um, the sciences at a place like Wheaton College, which is an evangelical Christian college, um, you, you have to talk about those things. Um, how does Wheaton approach that? Well, somewhat with fear and trembling because we, we want to be careful because it's become one of those real touch point issues. And uh, we also want to be open and honest and that's difficult to do sometimes when, a, when you have a polarized situation like that. And, and a lot of people think they have the right answers. Um, it's interesting to realize that professors who've been studying these things sometimes for 30, 40 years don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd say there's a, a very healthy dose of honesty and um, the proper kinds of agnosticism, not in God, not, not in our faith, but in exactly how these things match. Limits of our knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. And so we try to cover the different kinds of issues that are involved in origins. We have a nice, incredible four-hour class in origins that we teach for general education, which I think is, a, oh gosh, it's a flagship course for the, everybody else ought to be able to emulate it because we have professors from all the different departments. But we in geology have to, of course, deal with things like the age of the earth, the fossil record, and these sorts of things. And we present what has classically been done in geology. And the interesting thing is most of the ideas of age of the earth, of an ancient earth, have come from people of Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So this separation between age of the earth and faith and what's conservative and what's liberal, a lot of this is a fairly recent fabrication. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I'll be careful in what I say. I don't want to irritate anybody. Uh, but orthodox Geology and Orthodox Christianity can go together as long as you are humble and honest about places you just don't understand how they fit together. And it's the same thing I'd say with probably other parts of Scripture as well, where we realize, as you know, as Peter said about Paul, 
there's just things in Scripture sometimes that are hard to understand. Mm-hmm. We have to be honest about that. Yeah. Uh, and, and that works on both sides, doesn't it? When you talk about the humility and um, the ability to say, honestly, I don't know, uh, that would go for the scientific community mm-hmm. who, who need to say, some of them, we're doing science, we can't do your theology too, right? Oh, absolutely, right. absolutely. A fairly famous theologian who died a few years back made that statement at a big meeting at the University of Chicago one time. As as he was trying to defend science and theology, and these other guys kept pushing it and pushing, he says, "No, wait a minute. You want it your way too. You can't have it both ways. There has to be there has to be a negotiation and a compromise, recognizing you have the two different realms of understanding, and the one that's dealing with things that most of us would say are supernatural are not easily amenable to dealing with those things that are natural. So there is a there's a even man trying to think God's thoughts. There's a yeah. disjoin there. Yeah." You, you're the con- uh, contributor to the book called Perspectives on an Evolving Creation, uh, Erdman's book. Um, I, I've looked at that just enough to know it looks like a book I need to read. It's, mm. it's, it looks like a fascinating book. That title is going to bother some people. Oh, sure. Just in itself. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, let's just ask the question flat mm-hmm. out, Jeff. Uh, so a, a, a Christian and evolution, can, that, can the two live together? Oh, there's been so much print and talk devoted to this whole issue. And you've got people on both sides, both ends, both poles, I should say. I didn't want to use the word extremes, <laughs> who think it's completely incompatible. Mm-hmm. And yet, when we see from science with, a, with an open mind and an open heart, that there is evidence of change apparently through time, and what looks like long, long periods of time, not sudden change, and everybody I know who studies this really does acknowledge that. Um, sometimes I'll make the statement, maybe get in a little trouble for it, but people don't come to the idea of a young earth through their science. They come through their faith, mm-hmm. through their theology. Uh, and that's where you have a little bit of the conflict. But the science is still saying, you know, the earth is old and there's a progression in these organisms through time that we see in the rocks. And Christians have recognized that since the 1700s, maybe before. And we still see it. So if there is evolution, if there is some sort of biological change in organisms through time, which there seems to be very strongly uh, implied by the evidence, very strong implication. And at the same time, you happen to believe in a creator, particularly the kind of creator that we believe in, who's very personal and eminent and everything else. Then you end up with an evolution that has to be guided by creation. So the two are not incompatible. And you're saying that's okay with you. Well. I mean, you you can come to grips with that. I can say yes. I can allow that. It's different than saying I believe it because a belief is the strongest word we have. But I can allow it as a possibility. It doesn't do violence. Oh, absolutely not. And as a matter of fact, I I get distraught a little bit when I see how people set up barriers that like you're going to trip over this stumbling block because we're going to set it up so you can't have faith in science Mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big shame. And I think it's sad for our children to be given these two options when they really are both gods. I mean, the special creation that we see in scripture is, is his intention, his message for us. But the general creation that we see around us was his word too. The Bible's pretty clear about that and his love and his creativity went in and the two should mesh. And where they don't mesh, it's our problem. It's our Hmm. understanding problem and not a problem with God at all. Hmm. Is this a uh, J.B. Phillips problem? Your God is too small? (laughs) (laughs) Well, really, that's right. We could, you know, everything that's supernatural we can give to God and all the other natural things we can say are, you know, made by their, but it's all his. Mm -hmm. And I think that subdivision we make between supernatural and natural is just a, a human way of dealing with the finite nature of our brains. Mm-hmm. We just can't grasp it. Mm-hmm. So as you look at the evidence as a geologist um, and, and all of that, the fossil record, uh, as you delve into what you guys look at, when you look at those things, um, how old is the earth? I mean, what, what's, your mm-hmm. best, what's your best estimate? Well, you know, it's one of those things, again, where there are experts in all these different fields and the huge consensus would be among people who look at evidence, particularly now radioactivity is, is probably the foremost way of looking at the duration of ancient rocks. Um, the idea that the Earth's about 4.6 billion years old has been around now for a few decades, and that's prob- nobody's really modified that, and I don't have any reason to, to... I mean, there's so many independent witnesses to that, type of an age that you feel there's got to be something to it. Hmm. 
And so none of us would really question that. We almost feel like we have to question that because it really isn't an issue of faith. Mm -hmm. And whether the earth is four and a half billion or 50 billion or 20 minutes or whatever it happens to be, if that's what God did, he did it that yeah. way. Right? And that would make the universe... 13 point, this is from the physicists, I guess. I used to think it was somewhere between 10 and 20 billion. They said, no, it's 13.7. I'm going, wow, you've really never. But at that point, who's counting? Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and in terms of our vision of, of God, it's still nothing. It's still really nothing for the infinite yeah. one. And know? that's where it exceeds our mental capacity. And things it? that exceed okay. our ability to observe, things that are too fast, too slow, too cold, too high, whatever, mm. we're suspicious because they don't filter through our understanding. And yet I think God's trying to say, look, I'm, you, know, you gotta accept that I'm a mystery and a lot of things I've done are mysteries. Mm -hmm. So don't feel like you've got everything figured out, please. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think both sides, um, theologians and scientists say, oh, this is it. We got the final word here. And we really don't. Yeah, There must be moments, Jeff, I would think teaching this, that, that for a Christian and in a Christian classroom, they're just this, sort of dissolves into worship, doesn't it? I mean, when you see these oh. amazing things and you say, let's just stop here and say, yeah. what an amazing yeah. God. We well, have. thanks for saying that, Greg, because again, I mean, just coming back from South Dakota and just sitting in awe of views, I'm, I'm, I'm really, because I'm a field geologist and I've been for a long time, I love plants, flowers, dragonflies, flowing water, clouds, skies. And to sit there, and there's just something that clicks inside, and I can't define what that is, but I really do know that it, it leads to worship. And even when I start thinking about the rocks and their antiquity and what they've been through and that they do things that just shouldn't happen, hmm. you know, we, we can't make them happen in a laboratory. Yeah. We try. We can't do it. Um, so that does give us this real sense, again, of, of the power the, the, the scale of what God can do. And then you get the astronomers who start looking out there. Um, I have enough trouble just trying to cover the stuff on Earth myself, <laughs> you know. But yeah. you're right, it really is. It's, for me as a geologist, it has been fantastic in the sense that I grow stronger and stronger. Flying in an airplane, looking, get the window seat so I can look out at it with the ground. Mm -hmm. And people who don't do that are really missing out because there's incredible features down there, yeah. you know, whether it be what ice or water has carved or the color of the rocks. And God didn't have to do it that way, but he did. And he built something in us to be in awe. Right. And I think the value too, Jeff, of a Christian, a liberal arts setting is that every discipline then brings that, yes. you know, the, uh, the geologists, as you say, the astronomers, the biologists, even the humanities. Then oh. you begin to look at music and you say, oh. this all uh, can add together to praise God. Absolutely. Right? And, and there's something in common in all those things, although we have a very difficult time trying to find the commonalities. We get ourselves in little compartments. Uh, and one would hope that Wheaton College has done some but could grow in this idea of interdiscipline cooperation and that we could share those things with each other because there's certainly people in the humanities who have a strong sense of appreciation for the natural world. And those of us that are sort of poets looking at rocks mm -hmm. and things too, because we, we really do want to enlighten the entire characteristic within the liberal art, Christian liberal arts of, of how these things relate. Mm -hmm. And they all point back to the creator, of course. Jeff, yeah. it's been great to have you. Thank you so much. Oh, Pleasure to, you. to talk to you about all these things. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jeffrey Greenberg is professor of geology at Wheaton. And uh, by the way, if you'd like to know more about the sciences at Wheaton, just visit the website wheaton.edu. For Inside Wheaton, I'm Greg Wheatley.